Let's close our eyes for prayer. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer. That as we start a new series of studies today, the Lord will touch your heart, open your eyes, and see the truth that is revealing to us that you receive the fullness of the blessing of the Lord. Let him hear your prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your preparation of the heart. And thank you for the desire to learn from you and to receive from you. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you open the pages of the scriptures to every one of your children in Jesus' name. Yeah. Enlighten us. Teach us, Lord. Help us to learn from your word and grant us the great and the grace and the strength, the humility as well as the faith to take in your word and to abide by your word in Jesus' name. Because doers of the word are not listeners only. And we pray, Lord, that this word will be lived out of every life in Jesus' name. And we pray that people around us will see the effect, they will see the power of the word in our lives in Jesus' name. Because living epistles of your word that will take this word by life, by witness, by preaching, by practical demonstration, the teaching of the word of God in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we'll begin a new study, a new series, and it is the gospel according to St. Mark. And so we come to chapter 1 today. We're looking at chapter 1 of Mark, verses 1 through to 6. Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 1, all through to verse 6. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way, thy way before thee. And the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and day of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. John and John was closed with the camel's ear and with a girdle of his skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. Those are the introductory verses we're looking at today as we consider the preparation of the way for the new king, preparing the way for the new king. Here comes John the Baptist, 
and is preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the King of kings, and the very Son of God, our Savior, our Redeemer, and the one who has come to reverse the cause that man brought upon himself from the Garden of Eden. But before we go into all the verses we have here, we need to make an introduction of the writer. And that is the introduction of the author. His name is Mark. And actually we know that uh, his family, especially the mother, was a real believer in the Lord. In the early church, prayer meetings were held in the house of the mother. And that's the first place we come across this Mark that is actually John Mark. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Reading from verse 11. Acts chapter 12, verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of his surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Peter the apostle had been in the prison, in prison for the word of God, in prison for the truth of the gospel. He was preaching, in prison for exalting the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior in Jerusalem. And James had been slain, and so Herod thought the next person will be Peter. And this Peter was put in the prison, and the angel of the Lord came and opened the prison doors and removed all the chains and brought him out. And where did he go after he came out of the prison? Look at verse 12. And when he had considered the sin, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. He came to the house of of the mother of John Mark. That's the John Mark that wrote the gospel was studying today. It says, when many were gathered together praying, and as uh, these uh, people gathered together praying in the house of the mother of John Mark, John Mark was not far away. In fact, we are told that when Paul and uh, Barnabas, when they were to go out to give relief to the church in Jerusalem, look at the position of Mark with them. We're looking at uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. They had been in Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And he took of them John, whose surname was Mark. And so he went with them in their first missionary journey. But then, because he was young, and because of the pressure of the way for him, he couldn't stand all the rigor of the way in preaching the gospel with Barnabas and Saul at that time. So he went back. Eventually, they wanted to go and visit those churches again where they had ministered. I will come to Acts chapter 35, ch Acts chapter 15 rather. Acts chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 37. In verse 37, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So you see, John Mark was not a stranger to the preaching of the gospel. Even though he had been discouraged, and because of his lack of experience and lack of strength, at the first time, he had gone back. And now they wanted to go and visit the places where they had preached the gospel. And Barnabas said, John Mark must go with us. And we're told in verse 38, but Paul thought not good to take him with them. Whose who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. There's a disagreement between Barnabas and Saul. And eventually, Barnabas took Saul, uh, Barnabas took uh, Mark, and then went to his own city. And Paul, the apostle, took uh, Silas, recommended by the church. But things did not continue that way for a long time. Because eventually Paul the Apostle saw that that young man had now recovered himself and was willing to now take him 
he was willing to now bring him near Colossians chapter 4. I read from verse 10. Colossians chapter 4, reading from verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted thee. And Marcus, that's Mark, sister's son to Barnabas, he says, a touching whom ye received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And so you see, he came back, he reconciled with God, he reconciled with Paul, and then Paul, the apostle now, recommended him. If he comes to you, you can take him, you can accept him. Philemon chapter 1, reading from verse 24. Philemon chapter 1, reading from verse 24. Marcus, that's Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Here is Paul now affirming that Mark became one of his fellow laborers. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading here from verse 10, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 for demons have forsaken me having lodged this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica it says uh, Christians uh, to Galicia Titus to uh, Dalmatia and it says only Luke is with me take Mark here is the writer of the gospel according to St. Mark. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And so you will see the familiarity now of the closeness of the tie of the fellowship between Mark and Paul the apostle. But not only that, as you come to First Peter chapter 5, First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse, uh, from verse 13. First Peter chapter 5, verse 13. It says, the church that is at Babylon elect, elected together with you, saluted you, and so does Marcus, my son. Marcus, my son. And so he also had close, intimate relationship in the ministry with Peter, the apostle. The, the story is this, that Mark was a real child of God. He was born again, but he was young. And because he was young, when he went to a van with Paul and uh, Barnabas uh, for the first missionary journey, he couldn't uh, keep up because his strength failed him his courage failed him and his consecration failed him his desire to serve the lord failed him because of the difficulty of the way so temporarily he went back but as he went back somebody was still concerned about him Barnabas was concerned about him obviously praying for him obviously wanting the very best for him as he were going to go again to visit the churches where they had gone Barnabas said let Mark come along with us Paul said it's not matured enough it's not old enough and it is not strong enough to bear the rigor of the way push him aside for now but Barnabas thought a different and eventually Barnabas took him and schooled him and taught him and discipled him and then Paul the apostle to, to uh, sorry Peter took him up also and he schooled him and he taught him and discipled him until he could refer to him as Marcus my son and eventually Paul the apostle he didn't forget about Mark he was thinking about him he was praying for him and eventually he wrote to the believers and said when Marcus comes to you receive him because he is also profitable in the ministry in fact when i come to your side i'm going to look for that mark so that i would uh, he will become one of my uh, followers i will become one of the workers that also walk along with me and here mark now was going to write about the lord jesus christ and he tells us in mark chapter one he says the beginning of the gospel of jesus christ 
the Son of God. As you think about Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, these are the four Gospels, the life stories of the Lord Jesus Christ about his life about his ministry, about his sacrifice, about his death, about his burial, about his resurrection, about his ascension, and about his being now on the right hand of majesty on high. But we're going to discover the difference between Matthew and Mark. You see, Matthew began his own writing by looking at the genealogy, by looking at the, at the people that were before the Lord Jesus Christ, and this one began got this and this one begat this and this one begat that until they came to the Lord Jesus Christ but you see that in Mark there's nothing like genealogy also if you look at Luke you see the same thing that Luke gives the background of the Lord Jesus Christ this one begat that and that one begat this one and this one begat this other one until they came to the coming of Jesus Christ here on earth but as you look at John John also does not give a human genealogy. He didn't say that these are the parents and all that. It just began in the beginning, in the dateless past, was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And then he went on. Come to Mark now. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How you see that Mark wrote this way? How you see that he didn't give any background, any genealogy, because he was writing actually to the Romans. He was writing to the Gentiles. He was writing to people that wanted to see what he did when he came. What did he accomplish when he came? And so he just went into that and he said, I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus is the king. Yet is the servant, is the savior, yet is the servant, is the redeemer, yes, the servant. He came to serve. That was the concentration of Mark as we look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, you see the reason why he wrote Mark chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 43. Mark chapter 10, verse 43, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. Listen to this now. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ referring to himself, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so he, uh, Mark wanted to show that this Jesus Christ, yes, is king, but he came to serve. Yes, is Lord, but he came to serve. Yes, is the Redeemer, but he came to serve. He came to take the position of a servant. Look at Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not to, to be he thought it not trouble to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of his servant. That's how Jesus came. He took upon him the form of his servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And so you understand why Mark did not write his genealogy. He was writing about his servanthood. He was writing about his service. I don't need the pedigree and the, and the genealogy of a servant. That's why he came to this and he said, we're coming back to John. He says, I begin with the gospel. I begin with the good news. I begin with the message. I begin with what Jesus brought from heaven and he came to give us on earth the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Tonight, as we begin this study, the title of the message tonight is Preparing the Way for the New King. It's the New King. 
and therefore he needed to prepare the way an herald would need to come before him and say the king is arriving the king is coming the king is appearing and you need to see you need to hear you need to learn you need to accept the message the ministry that the king has brought preparing the way for the new king. As we look at uh, these uh, verses today, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, the purpose and the proclamation of Mark. The purpose and the proclamation of Mark. Mark made a proclamation a proclamation about Christ, a proclamation about the Son of God, a proclamation about the gospel, the good news, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose and the proclamation of Mark. Point number two, the prophecy and the preparation by his messenger. A messenger came up before him. His name is John the Baptist. And Mark now introduces to us John the Baptist who came before Jesus Christ and to announce he is coming. He is announced in the midst of you. He is announced. He is greater than I. He is around. I am not able to bear an issue. He is around. I cannot even on fasting. On, I cannot lose the lashes of his shoe. He is around. He was before me. He is around. Is greater than I is allowed the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so you have the prophecy what had been said about John the Baptist, what had been said about the uh, herald of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the preparation by this messenger preparing the way of the Lord before he came. Point number three the preaching and the persuasion. In his message, the preaching, that's of John, and the persuasion in his message. Let's come back to point number one, the purpose and the proclamation of Mark. Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You notice the word there, the gospel. That's his aim, that's his purpose. He wanted to paint the picture, a full picture, a clear picture, a convincing picture of what the gospel is, of what the good news is. And he wanted to present that to the people because that is the scene, the gospel, that will even encircle the globe, that will reach to all the world. Look at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 10. Here are the words of Jesus now concerning what he brought, concerning what he taught, concerning what he provided, concerning what he presented to the people. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. That was the concentration of Mark, the gospel of the Son of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the good news. Man is lost. And there's only one way of salvation. A man could not save himself. And if man is not saved, he'll be lost and lost forever. That means he'll spend eternity away from God, away from the paradise and the happiness in the, in the heaven of God forever. But Jesus Christ has come. He's come to take us away from our darkness. He's come to take us away from our sin. And he says, that is the good news I brought to you. And Jesus said that good news, that gospel must be preached in all nations look at the final chapter of mark that is mark chapter 16 verse 15 mark chapter 16 verse 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Lord Jesus Christ said the important thing, the essential thing, the indispensable thing, the number one thing, and the final thing every creature should have before they can spend eternity with the Almighty God. They must have the gospel. And so Mark said, Here is my concentration. I'm concentrating on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 1, 
the beginning he said this uh, message we're bringing to you now because mark was reaching you know that's the gospel was reaching after jesus had died he said it had a beginning and i'm showing you now the beginning of that gospel of jesus christ the son of god you could ask the question from mark and say why why are you concentrating on the gospel why are you presenting the gospel? Why have you reaching the gospel according to St. Mark? Why have you given the world this gospel? From chapter 1 to chapter 16, it tells us now the reason why. He said there's a purpose for this. There's a purpose for the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's your purpose, Mark? Number one, to proclaim the sonship of Christ to proclaim the sonship of Christ. Look at that verse 1 again. It says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the Spirit-inspired purpose of the gospel of the Son of God. I want to proclaim to everyone that Jesus Christ whose gospel I bring to you, whose good news I bring to you, is the very Son of God. Come to Psalm 2. I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 2, reading from verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. It's saying it was said in the Old Testament, that Jesus will come, somebody will come, he will be the Son of God. And now I want to announce to you, I want to proclaim to you, and I want to declare to you that that Son of God has come, and I want to present him as the Son of God. The one reason then, number one reason why Mark wrote his gospel is to declare that this Jesus is the Son of God. Number one, to proclaim the sonship of Christ. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I read from verse 35. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy sin which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And so Mark, number one, wanted to declare to the people and proclaim the sonship of Christ. Number two, he wanted to pronounce the seal upon Christ the seal upon Christ. He wanted the people to understand, that's why I wrote the gospel, that the seal of heaven, the stamp of heaven, is upon this Jesus that he was presenting. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He said, it's not only that, um, you know, he, angels proclaimed about him, he'll be the Son of God. He wanted to show that even the Heavenly Father has proclaimed him to be the Son of God. And so Mark then pronounced the seal on Christ that the Heavenly Father said, This is my beloved Son. In Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Mark chapter 9, verse 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. The seal of approval and the seal of appointment and the seal that came from the Heavenly Father that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, the one that came and brought the good news unto us that this Jesus is the very beloved Son of God. And Mark wanted to show that this Son of God is approved of the Father. 
is claimed by the Father and is sealed by the Father. This is my beloved Son. We're looking at John chapter 6. I read from verse 27. John chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 27. It says in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man, that Jesus Christ, shall give unto you for him as God the Father seal. Him as God the Father sealed. Mark wanted to pronounce the seal on Christ. Number three, he wanted to publish the salvation from Christ. He wanted to publish that the salvation we need that will link us up with God, the salvation we need that will reconcile us with God, the salvation we need that will forgive our sin and give us freedom, freedom from the chains of sin that bound us, that salvation is found in Christ to publish the salvation from Christ. We're looking at Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, I read from verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And Mark wanted everyone to understand that salvation that gives forgiveness, salvation that gives freedom from sin, comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to understand that. That's why that is pronounced. It says in verse 10, verse 10, but that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. It says to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. He wanted to publish the salvation that came from Christ. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, reading here from verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What's the reason Mark wrote this gospel? And what's the reason why we're studying this gospel? What's the reason why this gospel, according to St. Mark, is uh, preserved for us? Number one, to proclaim the sonship of Christ. Number two, it is to pronounce the seal on Christ. Number three, is to publish the salvation from Christ. Number four, is to portray the supremacy of Christ, to portray the supremacy of Christ, of all that had ever lived in history, of anyone religious or secular that ever lived, Christ is the highest, Christ is the greatest, he is supreme above everyone, he has supernatural power that no man before him, no man after him ever had by himself. And Mark wanted to portray the supremacy of Christ in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, reading from verse 39. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea. Nobody ever commanded the sea like that. Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that she have no faith and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obeyed him? He wanted to portray the supremacy of Christ. It tells us in chapter 15, reading from verse 37, Mark chapter 15. Reading from verse 37, 
the supremacy of Christ is high, higher than everyone, is great, greater than everyone, is supreme above everyone. We're told in Mark chapter 15, verse 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was wrenched in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion that which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was a son of God above everyone that ever came, above everyone that ever served Israel, above everyone on the pages of the history of the world supreme and mark wanted the people reading the gospel he wanted them to understand the portrayal or the portrait of the supremacy of christ number five to prove the servanthood of christ he wanted to prove by all the things that christ did and to all the people that christ did those things the power of christ manifested in a humble way and in a selfless manner, he wanted to prove the servant church of Christ by looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 44 and 45. Mark chapter 10, verses 44 and 45. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, uh, to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the purpose of Mark. He wanted to show as great as Jesus was, as high as Jesus was, as supreme as Jesus was, as supernatural as Jesus was, yet he bent down. And he bent low to serve humility, humanity rather, not only with the sacrifice, but with all the power that he commanded, all the power of heaven that he brought with him, he served as a servant. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of his servant. He took that upon him, the master of angels and the master of men the father of eternity and the eternal one who had been in existence with the almighty God from all eternity. He came to this world and he made himself a servant. He says, but he made of himself uh, no reputation, but took upon him the form of his servant and he was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. That's what Mark wanted to emphasize. He wanted to prove the servant church of Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He emphasized that, and therefore he proclaimed the sonship of Christ. Jesus Christ had the seal and approval from heaven, and so Mark pronounced the seal on Christ. Jesus Christ brought salvation, freedom from sin, forgiveness from sin, and to prepare us to be in heaven forever. And so Mark published the salvation from Christ, and not only that is great, is high, is being with God, equal with God from all eternity. And so Mark portrayed the supremacy of Christ, and yet he came to serve. High, he bent low, great, and yet he came to serve everyone is divine. And even though he's divine, he came to serve humanity. He proved the servanthood of Christ. Number six, to present the sacrifice of Christ. 
to present the sacrifice of Christ. Mark is assuring us, Mark is reminding us that when he came, he came for this one ultimate goal, this final goal, that he will give his life as a sacrifice for the redemption and for the ransom of men. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He gave his life for you. And now Mark is reassuring us and assuring you, you can be saved. The sacrifice for your face, the sacrifice, the atonement for your sin had been made. And whosoever now will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. First Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Even Christ our Passover, he has shed his blood. And the Heavenly Father has said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And you can escape the judgment to come, because even Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Number seven, he wanted to preview the second coming of Christ. Mark wanted to say that you see him today in humiliation. You're going to see him in glorification. Is going to be glorified. And so don't think it's just, you know, the Son of Man who is serving. is coming again. And when he comes again, he's going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Mark chapter 13, I read from verse 25. Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 25. And the stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's portraying the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. A preview. It tells us in chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 61. Mark chapter 14 from verse 61. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Coming in the clouds of heaven. Mark chapter 9, the preview of the second coming of Christ. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they see the sun till they see the come the kingdom of god come with power and after six days jesus take it with him peter and james and john and lead us them into an high mountain a patch by themselves and he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias, Elijah, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, and Peter answered, and said unto Jesus, Master, 
it is good for us to be here. Let, um, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias, for he wist not what to say. For they were so afraid, and there was a cloud that covered, that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. That's a preview of the coming, second coming of Christ. Look at the comment, inspired comment, inspired interpretation of Peter in Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 17. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 17. For ye received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And uh, Peter related that to the second coming of Christ. Verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised tables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You understand then why Mark wrote the gospel that we're studying? Number one, to proclaim the sonship of Christ. Number two, to pronounce the seal on Christ. Number three, to publish the salvation from Christ. Number four, to portray the supremacy of Christ. Number five, to prove the, son, the servant church of Christ. Number six, to present the sacrifice of Christ. Number seven, to preview the second coming of Christ. Now we come back to Mark chapter 1. And I'm reading verses 2 and 3. Point number 2, the prophecy and the preparation by his messenger. The prophecy and the preparation by his messenger. Look at Mark chapter 1 verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before my face, which shall prepare the way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This is a prophecy concerning John the Baptist, that he will come before the Lord, he will come and prepare the way of the Lord. Let's see Isaiah, where the prophecy was given that Mark is quoting. Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And you can see like our courage, the prophecy is talking about John the Baptist in the desert. That's why eventually came and then he made proclamation concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. He was saying, the king is coming. The king is coming. And now the king has come. Look at verse 4. It says, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made lone and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain look at verse 5 and the glory of the lord shall be revealed when christ comes that's what the prophecy is saying that john the baptist will proclaim before the coming of the lord that the coming of the lord will bring the glory of the lord it shall be revealed and all flesh shall see together for the mouth of the lord has spoken it 
the prophecy that Mark referred to also brings in uh, Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 1, still referring to the coming of this messenger of the Lord, that is of John the Baptist. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Can you imagine that uh, in the case of Isaiah, 700 years before Christ came, he had prophesied that a forerunner will come. He had prophesied that the herald will come. He had prophesied that the messenger of the Messiah will come. He'll prepare the way before the coming of the Lord. And now Malachi, about 400 years before Jesus Christ came, had also prophesied that this one coming it will be preceded by John the Baptist, a man that will be like Elias. Behold, I sent my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. It was predicted before he came. Now Matthew chapter 3. Reading from verse 1. Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 in fulfillment of that prophecy in fulfillment of what Isaiah had said in the fulfillment of what Malachi had said now John the Baptist came to fulfill the prophecy it says in Matthew chapter 3 verse 1 in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of. This is he that was announced about. This is he that was prophesied about by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight and then we're told in luke what the character will be what the ministry will be that is the character of this john the baptist and the ministry of this john the baptist and the preparatory message that he will have luke chapter 1 reading from verse 15 luke chapter 1 verse 15 for ye shall be great in the sight of the lord it says uh, when that john the baptist the herald of christ the messenger of the messiah when he comes in the sight of god he'll be great he might not be great in the sight of men people on earth might not put great value on him but in the sight of the lord he shall be great and then he says he shall drink neither wine nor drink nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the holy ghost even from his mother's womb he'll have a peculiar experience he'll have a peculiar evidence that this is the herald of the coming king he'll be filled with the holy ghost or the fruit of the spirit or the power of the spirit or the gifts of the spirit and with the boldness of the spirit even from his mother's womb verse 16 and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He'll bring a repentance, he'll bring reconciliation with the Father, he'll bring righteousness in the lives of the people. Many of those children of Israel, as they will hear, as they will listen to John the Baptist, they'll turn away from their sin and they'll turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Make ready a people 
prepared for the Lord. Luke chapter 1, verse 7 to 6. Luke chapter 1, verse 7 to 6. Now Zacharias, the father of John, the Baptist, was filled with the Holy Spirit. As was filled with the Holy Spirit, was now going to declare the might of God, the heart of God concerning this son, John the Baptist, that was just born. Look at verse 67 to start with. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied, saying, here is part of the prophecy, verse 76. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. And, shall, and for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. Zechariah knew by the Spirit that this John, John the Baptist, this John, his own son, will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give the knowledge of salvation unto the people by the remission of their sins. John was to come and give the knowledge of salvation unto the people and they will repent of their sins, they will believe on the Lord and they will be saved and their sins will be taken away from them. 78, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And so you understand what it was to come for and what it was to do. Luke chapter 7 verse 27. Luke chapter 7 reading from verse 27. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. You understand? John the Baptist was not an accident. His birth was not an accident. His birth was not an afterthought. His birth was not by the will of man, the father or the mother. This is the very plan of God. And the message had been given before he was ever born. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Look at verse 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the John, John the Baptist, who emphasized the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reading from John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Reading from verse 28. John chapter 3. Reading from verse 28. He yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. I'm just here to prepare the way. I'm here to introduce, I'm here to announce that the real Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ is coming. The one that will take away your sin. The one that will give you salvation. The one that will link you up, reconcile you with God, is coming. And I come to announce his coming and his arrival. Verse 29, he that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled and here the conclusion of his message to the people in comparing contrasting himself with the lord jesus christ he must increase but i must decrease he must increase but i must decrease we'll come back to mark chapter one we've seen number one 
the purpose and the proclamation of Mark. The reason why he wrote the gospel according to St. Mark. We have also seen the prophecy and the preparation by the messenger John the Baptist. Point number three now, the preaching and the persuasion in his message. The preaching and the persuasion in his message. Let's come to Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 4. John chapter 1, reading from verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Verse 5, and there went out unto him all the people, all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and they were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 6, and John was clothed with camel's ear, and was a girdle of his skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, the preaching and the persuasion in his message. As you look at verses 4, 5, and 6, you see number 1, John's preaching. John's preaching, verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission, the forgiveness, the cleansing, the removal of sins. Number two, you see John's persuasiveness. John's persuasiveness. It was so persuasive that we are told that there went out unto him all the land of Judea. What a persuasion. And then it says, and they of Jerusalem, and they were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Number three, you see John's personality. John's personality. Look at verse six. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of his skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. What did he preach? This John the Baptist. What message did he give out to the people? Let's look at this, John's preaching. Number one, he preached repentance. He preached repentance. Matthew chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Matthew chapter 3. Reading from verse 1. In verse 1 of Matthew chapter 3, in those days came John the Baptist preaching. Preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Say and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is at hand. He preached repentance. Look at verse 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And it wasn't just a repentance hanging in the air. It wasn't repentance that was not understood by the people because he gave practical illustration for the repentance he was preaching. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 18. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 18. For John had said unto Herod, he preached to the high and to the low. He preached to the great and to the small. He preached to all people that came to him. And he didn't minimize the word. He didn't uh, kind of slash down his message when the great people were there. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Number one, he preached repentance. What else did he preach? Number two, he preached faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. 
he didn't tell them they will be saved all by themselves without believing on the Lord. He didn't tell them, just uh, turn over a new leaf. Just do the best you can and just act in a better way and then you'll get to heaven. No, number one, he said repent. Number two, believe on the one that is to come, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 4. Acts chapter 19. Reading from verse 4. You see what he emphasized? Face in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that he is on Christ Jesus. He preached repentance. And then he preached to believe on Jesus Christ who was coming after him and he mentioned him by name, the Lord Jesus. Number three, he preached salvation. He preached salvation. If he was going to fulfill what the Father had sent him for, he must preach salvation. Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 6. Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 6, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That's the message of John, repentance. The message of John, faith in Christ. The message of John, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 7 to 6. Luke chapter 1, Verse 7 to 6, and thou, child, this is John the Baptist, the father speaking about John the Baptist, ye ch thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before his face, the face of the Lord, to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. And through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give the light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Then he preached water baptism. John the Baptist. Preach repentance. That's what we are to preach today. That's what we are to emphasize today. As we talk to people to bring them unto the Lord. As we talk to people to bring them to the salvation that Jesus Christ has brought. The very thing we start with, the number one thing we start with is what John the Baptist started. Repentance from their sins. Number two, faith in Christ. That they must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. John said on Jesus who was to come. But now we are to preach the Lord Jesus Christ who has already come, who has already died, who already was buried, and who already rose from the dead, and who already has paid the price for our salvation. And then we are to emphasize salvation. And then what a baptism after that. Isn't that what Jesus himself said? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Let's look at John chapter 1 verse 31. John chapter 1 verse 31. And I, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I might come baptizing with water. And then number five, he preached repentance and freedom from sin. Repentance and freedom from sin. John chapter 1, 
verse 29 john chapter 1 verse 29 the next day john sees jesus coming unto him and says behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world he was telling the people before him the people who were standing before him that even now you can take all your sins away he take it he take it he take it away the sins of the world and for example for those who are still coming those who are still to be born here is the only one the lord jesus christ who takes away the sin of the world he takes away the external sin as he gets us saved he takes away the internal sin as he gets all sanctified he purifies us he cleanses us he sanctifies us and he circumcises our heart and takes even the original sin away by that one sacrifice he brings justification by that one sacrifice he brings salvation by that single sacrifice he brings redemption by that single sacrifice sacrifice he brings sanctification he takes the sins of the world away and he doesn't want anything to remain in the life in the heart in the spirit in the behavior in the character of any believer because jesus christ has come to take our sins away what did john the baptist preach repentance what did he preach faith in christ what did he preach salvation what did he preach water baptism what did he preach righteousness faith and freedom from sin what did he preach he preached baptism or the holy ghost baptism with the holy ghost he preached salvation he preached righteousness godliness sanctification and he preached baptism of the holy ghost he tells us in matthew chapter 3 matthew chapter 3 i read from verse 11 matthew chapter 3 verse 11 i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire that's the message of john the baptist that one coming will baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire matthew mark chapter 1 reading from verse 8 mark chapter 1 verse 8 i indeed have baptized you with water but he shall be baptized he shall baptize you with the holy ghost luke chapter 3 the message of john the baptist luke chapter 3 reading from verse 16 in luke chapter 3 verse 16 john answered saying unto them all i indeed baptize you with water but one mightier than i cometh the latchet of whose shoes i am not worthy to lose he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire it tells us in john chapter 1 john chapter 1 reading from verse 33 john chapter 1 verse 33 and i knew him not but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. That's what John emphasized. The experiences of the believer the experiences of the disciple as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ salvation after repentance and faith in Christ and then water baptism righteousness in our life sanctification deep righteousness that takes away sin even from our nature and then baptism power in the Holy Ghost number seven he preached the sonship of Christ, the exaltation of Christ, the fullness of Christ, 
the authority of Christ, the headship of Christ, and the supremacy of Christ. John the Baptist revealed the fullness of Christ to the people. And if anyone was ignorant after listening to John, it's because he didn't think through of the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ will do when he has come. John chapter 3, verse 27. John chapter 3, verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing, except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom, is the head of the church, is the bridegroom of the church. I bought the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase his supreme. He must increase, is exalted above all. He must increase because of his supremacy, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all, above all. John the Baptist emphasized that Jesus is above Aaron, above Moses, above David, above Isaiah, above any of the prophets, above John the Baptist himself, above all. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies and no man receiveth his testimony. He that has received his testimony has said to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. And see what he emphasized about the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, faith, salvation, water baptism, righteousness, holiness, godliness, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the sonship and the exaltation of Christ. And John did not release the people until he reminded them of judgment, eternal judgment, and the wrath to come. He preached about eternal judgment and the wrath to come. Matthew chapter 3 from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he says unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet, suitable, feet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down, is hewn down, and cast into the fire. And so we understand that John the Baptist preached a full message. We'll come back to Mark chapter 1. John's persuasiveness it was really persuasive and the people turned away from their sins and as they came to him they confessed their sins 
they repented of their sins, they gave up all those sinful habits, and they promised the Lord they will not go back into them, and they looked up to the one coming, Christ coming. So they believe on him, and they have the remission and the removal of their sins, and they had assurance of salvation. Look at how persuasive it was. We're looking at Mark chapter 1, verse 5. And they went out, they went out unto him all the land of Judea. He stayed in one place in the desert, in the wilderness, and they all came from every quarter unto him. And they of Jerusalem, from the capital city, and they were all baptized of him after hearing his word, after accepting his word, after believing his word, after turning away from their sins, and after confessing their sins, they were baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Number three, we find John's personality. We're looking at verse 6. John's personality in verse 6, and John was clothed with camel's hair. I was a girdle of his skin about his loins. He lived a simple life. He lived a humble life. And he lived the life of an herald, pointing not to himself, not exalting himself, but exalting the Messiah, the Christ, the one who was to come. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. And see how his personality affected even the people that listened to him. Mark chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 20. Mark chapter 6, verse 20. For Herod feared John. Herod feared John. He wasn't going about socializing. He wasn't going about eating here and there. He wasn't going about associating, affiliating with, you know, every dick and harry. That even Herod, the wicked king, feared John, knowing that he was a just man and an holy, holy man. And he observed him, he watched him, he investigated him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Let's see the testimony of Jesus concerning this John in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I'm reading here from verse 7. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see a rich shaking with the wind, an undecided man shaking with every wind of opinion, an undecided man that is shaking with every wind of difficulty. What went you out to see? A rich shaking with the wind, but what went ye out for to see? A man closed in such raiment, a soft person, such a tender person that could not bear the weather of the season, behold they that wear soft raiment and soft clothing are in the king's house. But went ye out, what went ye out for to see? A prophet, a prophet like Isaiah, announcing somebody is to come, and is announcing, and 700 years, that person has not come. Like Malachi, a person announcing his coming, and 400 years has not come. What went she out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet, he prophesies about Christ's coming, and Christ shows up. And Christ comes to him in the baptism. And he says, I'm the one to baptize of you. Do you come to me greater than a prophet? For this is he 
of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. That's what John came to do, and he prepared it well. Verily I say unto you, he says, Among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Of all the prophets that lived, of all the righteous men that lived, of all the Old Testamental covenant characters that lived, John was the greatest. But now he says, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Why? Because John died before Jesus went to the cross. He pointed him out, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. And after that, he was gone. And now, the least in the kingdom of God, you've heard about Jesus who went to the cross, who died for us. You've heard about Jesus who shed his blood. You've heard about Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall do. And greater works than this shall he do, because I go unto to my father and the least in the kingdom is greater than he and from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force here is the introduction of the gospel according to saint mark he tells us christ is coming and now Christ has come. He tells us repent, and as we repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his salvation is ours. As we are baptized in water, we bury the old life, and a new life rises up. And now we can walk in righteousness. We can also be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. And we can exalt the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can tell other people around us to run away and to flee from the judgment to come. And with the same persuasion, the same persuasiveness that John the Baptist spoke, by the grace of God, you too can speak today. And many will come to the Lord, both through your preaching and through your personality. I pray that the word of God will be a fruit in every one of our lives, even from today, in Jesus' name. Let me have the churches. Amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we've started this study today and we want the enrichment in the study, the word in the study, the grace in the study, the power of God in the study, the revelation in the study to be reproduced in our lives so that with courage, our stamina, and with a good sense of understanding, we go to reach out and present the gospel to all the people. Open your mouth and pray and let the message have the effect that God desires in your life, in your ministry, in your proclamation of the gospel.